Well, we're gradually getting the hang of it. Still unable to live without petrol, but it's still a conversation I'm having with myself. And I tried to ride my bicycle the other morning. I didn't like it. So I bought fuel. It made me pensive for about five minutes, just thinking about how lower income workers are faring, how the state employee is navigating this exponential rise in everything, and what the National Economic Council should be looking at right now as they mull over ways to help Nigerians endure this so-called short-term hardship till the long-term gains kick in. How long will this be? In my experience, the price of things in Nigeria have never gone down once they go up. How long should we keep our fingers crossed? Is this really going to happen? My guest believes in the long-term benefits, has a few questions about the ways the National Economic Council can help cushion the impact of this blow, and a region-by-region -region breakdown of what particular governors should be doing right now. That's in our interview segment. Meanwhile, our focus on the nation's capital examines the job ahead for the National Economic Council. And as we do every week, we have an update on the major stories from Nigeria's presidency. This is Dateline Abuja. And welcome to Dateline Abuja. I am Kayla Megwa. Let's begin with what happened in the President Tinubu led government this week on our Abuja Wrap. President Bola Tinubu has pledged to prioritize the health and safety of Nigerians, explaining that the health of citizens, particularly the workforce, is critical for any country to develop. The president made this known when he received in audience the co-founder of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Mr. Bill Gates, and president of Aliko Dangote Foundation, Alhaji Aliko Dangote, at the State House. The president says his administration would do all that is required to make their work in Nigeria and Africa successful, particularly in eradicating polio, measles, malaria, and other diseases from the continent. Nigeria must be polio-free by the end of 2023, says Vice President Kashim Shetima, as he acknowledges Nigeria is fighting a war on diseases and conspiracy theories, determined to hijack interventions to ensure adequate healthcare delivery at local levels, and insists that all hands must be on deck to ensure this war is won. He was speaking at a closed-door meeting at the banquet hall of the State House Abuja with members of the Nigerian Governors Forum, the Dangote Foundation, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation CEO, Mr. Bill Gates, who is in Nigeria on several engagements supporting innovation that can help accelerate progress in several sectors impacting lives across Africa, this time in the health sector. President Bola Tinubu on Friday joined other world leaders for the closing ceremony of the new Global Financing Pact Summit in France. The president had departed Nigeria for Paris on Tuesday for the summit. He used the opportunity of the event to review and sign a new Global Financing Pact that places vulnerable countries on a priority list for support and investment following the devastating impacts of climate change, the energy crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic. The financial summit, which is hosted by France, seeks to establish a system that will be more responsive, just and inclusive. It also seeks to fight inequalities, finance the climate transition and biodiversity protection and move closer to achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. The Presidential Election Petitions Court has admitted certified copies of the academic and work records of President Bala Tinubu tendered by the People's Democratic Party, PDP, and its candidate, Atiku Abubakar. The documents include a BSc certificate from Chicago State University, an NYIC discharge certificate, and a Mobile Nigeria Oil PLC certificate of service. The PDP had brought the documents through a subpoenaed witness, Mr. Mike Enauru, who is a private legal practitioner. He noted that the documents were purposely obtained by Tinumbu, but bore the name of Bola Adekunle Tinumbu, led in evidence by the lead counsel to the PDP, Chris Uche. The witness also tendered the EC-13 and EC-9 nomination forms and the letters written to the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, as attachments. Counsel to INEC, Abubakar Mahmoud, Tinumbu, Emmanuel Ukala, and the APC, Latif Fagwemi, all objected to the admissibility of the documents. Welcome back. 
While many Nigerians may understand the long-term impact of the removal of fuel subsidy and the single currency exchange regime, they still worry that the infrastructure and policies required to ensure the success of these plans are still lacking. The newly inaugurated National Economic Council has been mandated to work out palliatives to cushion the impact of the fuel subsidy removal on Nigerians. In this next report, we look at the task before the National Economic Council, headed by the Vice President Kashim Shatima, and the work ahead for the Nigerian people, given the enormity of these economic challenges. Please watch this. With an inflation rate of 22.41%, a debt profile hitting 77 trillion naira, and an unemployment rate expected to hit 40.6% this year, these men seated here at the council chambers of the State House in Abuja have an enormous task ahead of them. They make up the National Economic Council, headed by the Vice President Kashim Shatima. The National Economic Council, or NEC, established by Section 153, Subsection 1, and Paragraphs 18 and 19, Part 1 of the Third Schedule of the Provisions of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, 1999, as amended, is headed by the Vice President and has the 36 state governors, the Governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, and other co opted government officials as members. The National Economic Council meets once a month and is tasked with advising the President concerning the economic affairs of the Federation and measures necessary for the coordination of the economic planning efforts or economic programs of the various governments of the Federation. National Economic Council is hereby inauguration. And I wish you a successful tenor. As President Bola Tinubu inaugurates the council, he's clear on their marching orders. The task of growing our economy is quite enormous. But you and I ask for it, we campaign for it, we even dance for it, we beg for it. So we have no reason to complain. We must harness the growth potential of Nigeria and bring about serious development to bring us from a potential nation to a pragmatic economic development in a rapid manner. One of the main deliberations on the first NEC meeting is the issue of palliatives for Nigerians to cushion the impact of the removal of fuel subsidy. A decision that has been criticized by organized labor, who believe palliatives should have been in place before the subsidy removal. Negotiations are still underway. Those list of demands in terms of implementation and execution fall into those three broad categories of short, medium and long term you know, uh, categories. So that's what we decided today. And then other meetings will still be held in order to cross the T's and dot the I's. For the Nigerian, these are hard times. Transporters in Abuja's popular Jabi Park explain their ordeal. Let me bring an example. Like Kaduna will carry 3,500, will make it to be 5,000. Kano will carry uh, 7,000. Now we'll make it to be 9,000. But still, the money goes on fuel. You can see, going to Kano alone, vehicle will buy fuel of 60,000 naira. Kaduna alone, driver will now go and come back. A fuel of uh, go and come, 60,000. Kano Kuma, if you want to go and come, that's 120,000. So when you look at the, the money, you can see the driver will collect money from the passenger, and the passengers too are complaining. This thing affects us so really. How do you feel about the so if you check it now, you come here about let's say 30, uh, 30 minutes. You are here. Which motor do you say full and go? No passengers. Sincerely speaking, there is no passengers. You understand? But drivers will come because <coughs> up till today the thing is not stable. Passengers are not coming. You understand? Because of the increment. Another policy by the Tinubu administration causing ripples in the polity is a single forex exchange policy. Chris is an importer of lace materials. He sells his wares at the Garaki International Market. 
He doesn't see how the policy will benefit him unless Nigeria begins to produce and sell what he sells. I can say that from 2020 till date, we've been sourcing our dollars from the black market. And it's the same thing, the price that we've been getting it from the black market is still at the same range. So um, since the unification, we've not had any difference. Because uh, before now, we get it for 680, 700, sometimes it's still dangling at the same rate. It's very simple. Um, as you can see, most of the things we have in these shops are imported, you know. But if we start producing some of these things in this country, it will help the economy to grow because most of the dollars uh, we try to send out to get most of the things we consume in the country we reduce and we cannot produce where we don't have a um, good infrastructure infrastructure on ground a financial expert shijoke kechiku is concerned about the non-inclusion of the private sector in the national Mateo, economic council for a more balanced welcome. outlook of the state of the economy yeah. He doesn't believe that the way of palliatives for the Nigerian people is the best approach. He believes the council should investigate revenue generation and target inflation triggers. Those things that are the revenue drivers, we need to identify them one after the other to see whether we are getting, optimizing our revenue from these areas. Are there various uh, ministries and uh, parasitals that are generating revenue? How well are they generating? Are they optimally generating what they're supposed to generate? If they're generating, are they paying into the coffers of government? Because I know there are a lot of parasitals are supposed to be generating money. They generate for their own use. They don't even transfer uh, remit to the account of government. So we need to address those areas of revenue generation. Then we go to the uh, monetary policy area. The major areas we have issues today, the inflation rate, which is actually continue, which is continuing to grow, so what are those drivers of our inflation rates? What are those things that are making it to grow? We have to identify them, and there are many of them that we already know about. The exchange rate is one of them. The insecurity is another. Um, the cost of electricity and cost of uh, petroleum product is another. So if we identify that these are the things driving our uh, inflation rate, we need to identify them and deal with them one after the other and make sure that they have been taken care of. Other experts believe particular sectors of the economy are in dire straits and need the immediate attention of the National Economic Council, particularly the need for mass transport vehicles powered by compressed natural gas and uniting against corruption. Palliatives are not just simply issues around uh, trader money or giving out five or ten thousand. There may be non-financial uh, palliatives in terms of monies are not going to be distributed. For instance, we are still informed that uh, the CNG, compressed natural gas, is still under 200 or 150 naira per litre or thereabout. And it can provide cheap transport, which takes away the challenge of uh, transportation that is having a very big effect on workers and the transportation of goods and services. They can jointly take a vow to minimize the money which they are misappropriating and mismanaging at the state level because they are. If they were not doing that, things would have been better. So maybe you can say it's the previous regime. Some of them came back. They can sit down and examine their consciences and say, we will, let's, even if we are stealing 30 before, let's cut it down because it is difficult to tell them not to steal because you can't enforce it. Meanwhile, the National Economic Council at its very first meeting is on board with the production of CNG mass transit buses. They gave us a scenario recommending that there should be an adjustment, consequential adjustment, estimated at 702 billion to 919 million eight naira as part of uh, the allowances that should be given as petroleum allowance to all workers and as well as a 23 or to 45 billion month monthly uh, offer to cushion the effect to workers. What should these palliatives be? Will they be distributed fairly? Will there be accountability and transparency in its disbursement? Should the palliatives be physical or non-physical, as suggested by some experts? Is the word palliative a trigger to the Nigerian who's been hearing about palliatives for years and never received any? 
In a few weeks, the National Economic Council will be clear on what direction they will be going in this regard. Meanwhile, years of poor economic policies have taken a toll on the country's over 39 million micro, small and medium enterprises, which contribute 46.3% to Nigeria's economic output. The Nigerian has no choice but to wait as they look to the National Economic Council to enact policies that will ensure that these new realities produce the long-term desired results. My guest on the program is Mr. Idako Logbolade, a financial expert and economist. We go region by region in this interview to see what potential the governors there should be tapping into to show up revenue. And we also speak about palliative suggestions before the National Economic Council. Please watch this. Mr. Idako Logbolade, welcome to Dateline Abuja. Thank you for having me. I mean, it's a very interesting time we're having as a country, Definitely. beginning to understand a lot of the things that have been holding us back all these years. And then I think one of the resounding sentiments out there is, well, we have to hold on a little bit. Yes. We have to be patient with the way things are right now because we're expecting things to be better in the long run. Definitely. You buy this thought process? Definitely. Why, uh, why, why I, so? I believe uh, in the axiom that says no pain, no gain. Actually, the economy has been in a comatose for a long time. So these are measures that can jumpstart the economy. But the initial pressures will still be on the people the more because of these policies comes with a lot of hardship for the people. Uh, looking at uh, the subsidy removal, the exchange rate, uh, multiple exchange rate liberalization, and some of the other policies, definitely the people will feel the pain. Another, another thing that people have been talking about the, during this period is uh, short term suffering. Yeah. How long is, is short, short term? <laughs> Actually, looking at what is on ground, we know now presently that uh, because of these policies, inflation has increased, hardship has increased on the people, cost of uh, living has also increased. But when it becomes, the short term becomes reality, is when government has a quick fix solution to some of these problems. That is when the short term can actually be short. So that is why we want to implore this government to bring realistic policies that can alleviate the problems of the people. The palliative we are talking about is not a palliative just for a percentage of the, uh, of the people. Because if you are looking at palliative that centers on the workforce of the federal government, for example, what of the private sector? Well, let's, let's get into that because, yeah. you know, we've, we've been listening to the National Economic Council very, very carefully yes. to hear what it is that they have in store. Yeah. And one of the things that they've been talking about really is palliatives. Yeah. Now, there's a conversation going on. They said it was a recommendation. They're going to get back. I think it's more than a week now. So maybe yeah. in less than a week, we should be hearing back from the National Economic Council on these ideas of palliatives. One of them was increased salaries, yeah. you know, and, and the other uh, palliative uh, talked about some kind of wage, you know, that people are going to have to live on. What do you make of these suggestions? Actually, uh, increasing salaries vary because we also need to talk about capacity. Uh, the federal government struggled to increase the salaries, depending on the percentage increase. But what of the states? Because previous increases have not been implemented by most states. So we go back to square one. When we talk of also increasing salaries, have we factored in the private sector? Because uh, the private sector should be able to have the capacity to meet up with the minimum wage if it is increased. So that is another key. Talk to us a bit about the kind of palliative yeah. that the National Economic Council should be looking at, the one that is workable. Thank you. The kind of palliative that the National Economic Council should be looking at is one, ease of transportation, which is very key. The second one, efficient and less costly energy. That is, when we talk about the new initiative of uh, compressed uh, gas, CNG, that can reduce or be an alternative, a better alternative to petrol for powering uh, 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 the vehicles and uh, other machinery. That is another look that we look into. The other one is ensuring that additional burden is not added on the people. Because when we are talking of palliatives, it will not be effective if additional burden is added. I heard that uh, by Ju July, 
uh, electricity tariff is going to increase. So when that happens and you are trying to bring in a palliative, it will be of no effect. In places where subsidies are removed, in yes. places where, you know, these policies work, where there's a single foreign exchange rate, yes. those places have the infrastructure to, back it, to back it up. So was it a good idea to do it before the infrastructure to back it up was put in place? Actually, uh, the government is going bankrupt. The government is going bankrupt. And uh, if the, the subsidy is not removed now, it will get to a point that even the federal government will not be able to pay staff salaries and uh, other obligations will not be able to be met. These questions, how can, how do you, how can Nigerians navigate these times that we're in? Yeah. And how sensitive should the National Economic Council be to the Nigerian, especially as they're trying to make these rules right now? Now, the National Economic Council, which comprises of the vice president, the state governors, uh, actually know what is happening on ground. Most of the state governors know the problem that their people are facing. So I want the National Executive Council, uh, the Economic Council, to look with Nigeria's problem with a human face. Because if you are looking at it on policy basis alone, it will not touch the grassroots. So we need a solution that can affect both the urban and rural dwellers. If you were a governor, let's say you were a governor of a state, let's say in northern, in the northeast, for instance. Okay. So if you're, if you're a northeastern governor, you're dealing with a lot of issues. You're dealing with insecurity. insecurity. You're dealing with... Imp it's it, impossible it for, for the farmers to even work to right now, to, to go to the farm and yeah. thing. And that's where you generate income from. Definitely. What should a governor in that sort of situation be thinking about when it comes to, you know, raising the economic standard of his people? Definitely the first thing first is to attack the major problem that prevents his, uh, his indigents to be productive. And we know that uh, insecurity is prevalent in the Northeast. So a state governor in a Northeastern state should be concern about the security of lives and property in the state. Now, talking about the North Central... Because places like Benue, Benue the, the Catholic priest in Benue is going to have to deal with... With Hadas crisis, with security, yes. and... Uh, and cases of corruption <laughs> that he says corruption. there is no money in this state. In the, the vault moment. anymore. So what is the Father Alia going to, <laughs> going do, going to, about that. to do right now? Actually, I don't envy him presently. Now that the government in the state is in tune with the federal government because they are both APC states. I think the governor should be able to talk to the federal government to look at ways of having a peaceful coexistence between the herders and the farmers. When you see uh, investment of cement in Ewekoro, for example, uh, enlarging the communities, modernizing the communities, and ensuring that the, the citizens are employed, it helps the government to be able to look elsewhere, to be able to provide amenities as well. You know, we have a, a lot of new governors. Yes. How do you think that's going to play out? Do you think these are the men for the job? Are they, are they going to be able... You know, it's, it's a different thing to do things politically. <laughs> yes. And then when it's time for the, the job capacity. itself, the capacity to get the job done, will these first-timers, this first time, be able, time, to, be able to deliver? Uh, I've seen something in the Nigerian polity. Every state governor or even the president will try as much as possible to improve or impress in the first four years. So I'm looking at these governors and looking at the antecedent of the states to want to impress, despite the fact that they might, some of them might have met an empty treasury, to want to impress the people, to want to bring in ideas. Some of them have capacity and I believe can perform, like the Ekiti state governor, uh, can, he has the capacity. The one in Niger State, he has started doing things to make sure that, despite the fact that they are from the same uh, political party, he's trying as much as possible to move in a different direction to ensure that uh, that a kind of state like Niger State come up and uh, is self-sufficient on its own. So I see some of these governors having the capacity to do uh, the task that is ahead of them. Well, unfortunately, that's where we have to wrap it up. But thank you so much, Mr. Idakolo, for being with us on Dateline Abuja. Thank and you. good luck with all that you have to do. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks to my guest and to everyone who spoke to us today on the program. Freeing up funds for public spending on infrastructure and social projects. Reducing the reliance on premium motor spirit and embracing compressed natural gas. A renewed focus on transmission economics, 
fixing a disorganized transportation system, the discipline to explore other transport options that could reduce gas emissions and encourage startups and investors to invest in renewable energy sources and energy efficiency measures. All of these things have been identified as potential results of the proper enforcement of these new government policies. We truly must wait as Nigerians. We are in the patience part of the game and the government must deliver on these promises. This is the mindset many Nigerians hope the National Economic Council have as they begin the arduous process of revamping Nigeria's economy. That's Date and Abuja this week. Please let us know the happenings in your neighborhood using the social media handle showing right now on your screen. Thank you so much for watching. I am Kayla Magua. See you next time.